All right, so after posting my day in the life video and briefly discussing my hair care regimen, I've been getting a lot of requests from friends and family to discuss this topic. So here's everything I've learned about hair loss. What's going on guys? For those of you who are new here, my name is Kevin Jabal, physician entrepreneur based in Las Vegas, formerly in plastic surgery. Alopecia or hair loss is surprisingly common among both men and women. Androgenic alopecia, which is the most common type of hair loss, is estimated to affect approximately one half of men and approximately 15% of women. The majority of men who experience androgenic hair loss start noticing it during their 20s or 30s. For women, it typically presents during their 40s or 50s after menopause. For men, hair loss typically starts in the front of the scalp and the temporal region, whereas women tend to lose hair from the central area of the scalp, the crown. So I personally began experiencing hair thinning just over these last couple of years, which is what led to my desire to educate myself about hair loss and begin treatment. Because androgenic hair loss is the most common type of hair loss, much of this video is gonna be addressing this type. Do note that there are other causes of hair loss, including alopecia areata, telogen effluvium, and tinea capitis, among others. Before we get into it, I wanna preface this video by saying that this is not medical advice, no doctor-patient relationship is formed. This video is based on my experiences and what I've personally learned about hair loss. If you are considering starting any type of hair loss treatment, it is best to consult with your doctor first. With that out of the way, let's get into it. Let's start by discussing the cause of androgenic alopecia. We're gonna get a little bit into the weeds here, but I'm gonna to try to make it as easy as possible to follow along. The hair cycle consists of three phases. The antigen or growth phase, the catagen or resting phase, and the telogen or shedding phase. Approximately 90% of hair is in the growth phase or the rest phase, and approximately 10% is in the shedding phase. An average person will shed approximately 100 hairs a day, which is normal. Once the hair falls out, the follicle enters back into the antigen phase and the cycle repeats. Androgenic alopecia, as the name suggests, involves a class of hormones known as androgens, most notably testosterone. In our bodies, we have a particular enzyme called 5-alpha reductase that converts testosterone to DHT, also known as dihydrotestosterone. What's important to know is that DHT has a greater affinity for the androgen receptor than testosterone, meaning that it is more likely to bind to and activate these receptors. Activation of the androgen receptors in our hair follicles shortens the antigen or growth phase of the hair and causes it to progress through to the rest phase or shedding phase more quickly. Over time, as these receptors are repeatedly activated, the antigen phase becomes shorter and shorter, resulting in thinner, shorter hair follicles, which can end up becoming so small that they can no longer penetrate through the epidermis, which is our top layer of skin. Patients with high levels of this 5-alpha reductase enzyme, or antigen receptors that are more sensitive to DHT, are at higher risk of developing hair loss. So now that we know a little bit about how and why hair loss occurs, let's talk about what you can do about it. To start, it should be noted that non-surgical remedies for hair loss are generally aimed at arresting the progression of hair loss as opposed to reversing it. As such, early treatment is critical and you have to continue using these treatments for them to be effective. Many of these treatments are also synergistic, meaning that results are often better when using multiple treatments at the same time. One therapy that has been growing in popularity in recent years is low light laser therapy. Although the mechanisms are not fully understood, low level light therapy is thought to have biostimulatory effects on tissues and is presumed to prolong the growth phase, stimulate re-entry into the growth phase, and inhibit early transition into the shedding phase. Multiple studies have shown that low light laser therapy is effective at stimulating hair growth in both men and women. This is actually something that I use in conjunction with my other hair treatments, which brings me to the sponsor of this video, iRestore. iRestore is a low light laser therapy helmet. This means that unlike other handheld devices, you can multitask and be productive while still getting your treatments in. I can make tea or get my work done at my computer all while I'm doing my treatment. I bought the iRestore with my own money, was using it for a few months, and I liked it so much that I actually reached out to iRestore to work together. I've been using iRestore for 25 minutes every other day as part of my hair care regimen for about seven months now, and I have noticed a significant difference in my hair's thickness. The reason that I chose iRestore over other low light therapy options is that it combines 282 lasers and LEDs to provide the correct light output and power to stimulate the hair follicles. It also holds the LEDs and lasers away from your scalp, which helps provide more even coverage and prevent hot and cold spots. Another thing I love about iRestore is that it's incredibly cost effective. For my other hair care treatments, I spend almost $100 every month. But for iRestore, it's one payment up front and then I use it every other day for years to come. So over time, the cost per use is very affordable. This FDA cleared, clinically proven device is not in 
invasive, hands-free, and easy to use. Results may vary, but I love that iRestore stands behind their product with a 12-month money-back guarantee. Check out iRestore's website and take advantage of this exclusive offer. For a limited time, you can get $400 off at checkout when you use my code Jabal. In terms of pharmacologic interventions, there are currently two FDA-approved medications for androgenic hair loss finasteride and minoxidil. The most commonly used therapy for hair loss in men is finasteride. This medication was initially used to treat enlarged prostates, However, it was later approved for the treatment of androgenic alopecia at lower doses. Finasteride is what is called a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor. If you recall from earlier in this video, this is the enzyme that converts testosterone to DHT, which then binds to the androgen receptor, causing hair loss. In short, finasteride blocks this enzyme and prevents the conversion from testosterone to DHT. This in turn leads to lower levels of DHT, leading to less activation of the androgen receptor. Now, there are some side effects of finasteride that you should be aware of. DHT also has other functions within the body, and plays a role in libido and sexual arousal. That's why 2% of patients experience decreased libido, erectile dysfunction, and ejaculatory dysfunction. Although these adverse effects generally subside once an individual stops treatment, some people do report persistent symptoms even after stopping the medication. Of note, finasteride also decreases your total risk for prostate cancer, but increases your risk of high-grade prostate cancer by masking one of the blood markers used to identify it. In women, there's also a risk of birth defects, so finasteride treatment is typically reserved for post postmenopausal women. There are two types of finasteride treatment, oral and topical. The oral dose is 1 mg daily. The topical dose is between 100 to 200 microliters of a 0.25% solution. The benefit of the topical route is that the medication is more localized to the scalp, therefore you have a lower degree of systemic circulation, and therefore a lower risk of systemic side effects. That being said, you can still get side effects at the scalp, things like irritation and redness. Oftentimes, individuals will start with the topical solution and then move on to the oral route if they're still not seeing a response. Next, there's monotonous. Minoxidil. Minoxidil was first developed as a blood pressure treatment, however, many individuals reported increased hair growth as a side effect. This eventually led to its use for treating androgenic hair loss. Minoxidil is a potassium channel blocker that works by widening blood vessels around the hair follicles. Theoretically, this allows more oxygen, blood, and nutrients to enter the follicle and to promote growth. Unlike finasteride, minoxidil is a prodrug, meaning that it is not in its active form. It's only when it interacts with the sulfotransferase enzymes present in our hair follicles that it is converted into its active form. For this reason, there is a lot of variation in individuals' response to minoxidil depending on their level of sulfotransferase activity. Minoxidil also comes in oral and topical forms. The topical form comes in either a liquid solution or as a foam. Liquid solutions typically contain the compound propylene glycol, which improves the delivery of the drug but can also cause local irritation. The foam is quicker to dry and more easily localized. The dose for men is 1 ml of 5% solution or 5% foam twice daily. The dose for women is generally 1 1 ml of 2% solution twice daily, or 1 ml of 5% foam once daily. The dose is typically less for women, as they are more susceptible to unwanted hair growth elsewhere on the face. The dose for oral minoxidil for women is generally 0.5 to 2.5 mg once daily, whereas for men it's 2.5 to 5 mg daily. There's also sublingual minoxidil, however, this is newer, so there isn't a ton of research on it yet. That being said, preliminary studies do show some promising results. These are the only two FDA-approved treatments and should be the first line of therapy when treating androgenic hair loss. That being said, there are other treatments that can be supplemental to finasteride and minoxidil. First is tretinoin. This medication is generally used to treat acne and other skin diseases, including sun damage and wrinkles, However, there is research that suggests it could also be useful in treating hair loss. When used for androgenic alopecia, it's usually used in conjunction with minoxidil. This is because tretinoin is an upregulator of follicular sulfotransferase enzymes. If you recall, minoxidil is a prodrug, meaning that it is not in its active form and needs the sulfotransferase enzymes in the hair shaft to convert it into its active form. In one study, 43% of subjects initially predicted to be non-responders to minoxidil were converted to responders following five days of topical tretinoin. This is why I usually use use a solution that contains finasteride, minoxidil, and tretinoin, as research has shown combination therapies to be more effective in treating hair loss. Next, there's microneedling. This is a minimally invasive treatment that involves using needles to create superficial wounds on the scalp. Although the exact mechanism of microneedling is not well understood, it is thought to occur through stem cell activation and facilitating the release of growth factors in the scalp. Research has shown microneedling to be an effective treatment for hair loss, especially when combined with other treatment modalities, as the punctures are thought to aid in the delivery of other topical treatments. Microneedling can be done at your physician's office. However, there are many over-the-counter devices to allow you to do microneedling at home. There are derma rollers, which you run over the scalp, and these can create the micropunctures. 
However, a problem with these is that they can grab onto the hairs and can either cut them or thin the hair. For this reason, Dermapens are generally the more recommended version as the needles are stamped vertically, so they're less likely to actually pull or cut the hair. In terms of the depth of the needles, there's no clear-cut consensus. However, the deeper you go, often the more painful it is. Going too deep also causes scarring. The therapeutic window is thought to be around 0.5 to 2 millimeters. In this range, you're going deep enough to see results, but not so deep to be at the risk of scarring. It's important to note that the scalp also thins with androgenic alopecia, so one may need to use a more superficial needle as the hair loss progresses. For instance, maybe you use one to one and a half millimeter needles early on, but later on in hair loss, it may be better to use 0.5 to one millimeter. A good rule of thumb here is to use the needle depth that gets one to their desired endpoint, which is generally pinpoint bleeding with mild to moderate erythema. After microneedling, it's best to wait at least six hours to wash your hair. However, many people wait until the next day. The frequency can vary quite a bit, going anywhere from as often as once per week to once every eight weeks. Next, there's platelet-rich plasma, which is often done with a physician, such as a dermatologist. Platelets in your blood contain a high concentration of growth factors, which stimulate cell proliferation, matrix remodeling, and angiogenesis, which is the creation of new blood vessels. Essentially, your doctor takes a whole blood sample, then they centrifuge it, which helps to isolate the platelets and growth factors, and then they take that and inject it into your scalp using small needles. Treatments are typically done once a month for three months, followed by once every three to four to maintain response from there. This method is typically combined with microneedling in order to aid in delivery of the platelets to the hair follicles. There are few side effects from this treatment method. However, redness and swelling at the treatment site are common, and some patients can experience transient headaches. Next, there's ketoconazole shampoo, which is another thing that I've been experimenting with in my own life. Ketoconazole is an antifungal, which has been shown in both rodent and human studies to be beneficial for hair growth. You can get a 1% formulation over the counter. However, 2% is available with a prescription. The main adverse effect with ketoconazole is hair dryness. That being said, the literature on this is still pretty limited and more research needs to be done. And lastly, there's hair transplant. This is where a surgeon removes hair, including the root from one area and then moves it to another area. For instance, they can move hair from the top of the neck or the back of the head to the top of the head. This is often the last treatment modality, which is only used once other options have been exhausted. It's also typically done late into hair loss so that the hair has already receded to a stable position. If done too early, the hair can continue to recede and you end up with patches above the transplantation site. And that is what I've learned about hair loss. Thank you all so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, then be sure to check out what I learned about intermittent fasting or this other video. Much love and I'll see you guys there.